Greetings in the name of Christ to you all. I'm Reverend Joan Pell and I bring you a warm welcome today from the Ipswich Methodist Circuit. We're glad that you could be with us today. And as we're now back in lockdown again, maybe some of you have found this service for the first time. A warm welcome to you all. It would be lovely to know that you're here. If you're watching this on our Methodistic website, then just above this video, you should find a form. You can type your name and location in and hit the red button, and that will tell us that you've been here. In our service today, I'm going to be the preacher, and we were, I'll be preaching on the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids, which I've called Running on Empty. Today is Remembrance Sunday as we remember those who've given their lives in service to this country. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And we're going to begin with our call to worship. Your parts are in white on the screen. So please join me. On this day of memory, we gather to sing and to pray we remember the past and look to the future. On this day when the guns once fell silent, we gather together to hear the words of the one who is love. In a world still filled with violence and war, we gather together to celebrate the promise of peace. In a world where cruelty abounds, we gather together to proclaim the God of compassion. Come now and let's sing the praises of the one who teaches peace. We come with prayers for the healing of the nations. So let's sing together, starting with number 696 from Singing the Faith, for the healing of the nations. Lord, we pray with one accord. Let us come before God now in prayer. God of love and peace, we come together today to remember. To remember with thanks those who've given their lives in service of others. To remember with sadness the suffering, destruction and pain caused by human conflict. 
We come also to commit ourselves to be peacemakers and peacekeepers wherever we can. Be present among us as we worship you and as we open ourselves to your word. To, your, to you be all glory, now and forever. God of peace, forgive us when we have participated in that which turns people against each other, for fueling anger and harbouring vengeance, for not heeding your call to love one another. Inspire us never to give up on the hope that your life offers us and the courage to see past war and desolation and live for the day when it will be peace. Hear the good news that love is stronger than hate and that the power of love is alive within you. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Well, the beginning of the last century saw the war to end all wars and then another world war within 25 years. The last decade saw conflicts within many lands between many ethnic groups in Africa, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Israel, Palestine and more. Lord, we name you as the Prince of Peace who urged us to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us. We remember all those who have perished in war, all those who have lost limbs, homes, family, country. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. So I invite you to stand as you are able, as we enter a period of two minutes of silence, as we stand in silence to remember their sacrifice.
we pledge ourselves to work for peace and reconciliation in our homes, our neighbourhood, our country and our world. Let us pray together. Living God, by whose love we are united with one another across the boundaries of time and space, bring us to a new remembrance of your love and life reflected in earth and sky and every person who ever lived. Teach us to be reconciled to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we're going to continue in song as we sing Fred Kahn's words, God, as with silent hearts we bring to mind how hate and war diminish humankind. Number 698. Our scripture for us today is Emma Boyer, and Emma is a circuit administrator. Our reading today is from Matthew, chapter 25, and the first 13 verses. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps... They took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and dressed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for us and for you. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and they shut the door. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour.
Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, in our scripture today, Jesus uses another parable to explain once more what the kingdom of heaven is like. Only this time, instead of helping others and inviting everyone to the feast, there's no sharing and some are barred entry. Ten bridesmaids are waiting for the bridegroom to arrive and he's so late that they fall asleep and then five of them run out of oil for their lamps. The other five refused to share their spare oil and so the five without oil went off to get some more and of course that's just the moment that the bridegroom arrives and so they miss him. And by the time they get back, the wedding party's underway and the bridegroom refuses to let them in. It's not very nice behaviour and it's really a rather mean story. It makes it sound like hoarding and stockpiling resources is a really good thing. And if people are in need, then it's their own careless fault and they can't join the party. Take care of yourself and do not worry about others. You must be prepared and hang on to your oil in case there's an oil crisis. Is the kingdom of heaven really no different than the empires of earth, where we store up oil for our own survival? Is it one big oil conglomerate? With Jesus' parables, you usually have to dig a little bit deeper. We know from the Sermon on the Mount that we're not supposed to store up treasures on earth but instead to store up treasures in heaven. We know we're told not to worry about what we will eat, drink or wear. We know if we knock, the door will be open to us. We know not to judge the splinter in another's eye, eye while there's a log in our own. We know we should, not, we should forgive not seven, but 70 times seven. We know Jesus fed 5,000 unprepared, hungry people who had not packed a picnic. So is this parable telling us to ignore what Jesus said before? Or is there something else going on? When we read scripture, if it doesn't seem to pass the love test, then perhaps we've understood it wrong. Looking at it in context, chapters 24 to 25 of the Gospel of Matthew deal with a call to the disciples to be ready, faithful and responsive as they await the return of Jesus. So this parable is about the second coming, using the imagery of a first century wedding, where once the bridegroom appears, then the bridesmaids accompany the wedding party with lamps and torches from the bride's house to the groom's house where the ceremony would then begin. So if it's a parable about the need to be prepared as we wait for Jesus, then what is it intended to teach us? I want us to ponder two things this morning. Firstly, what's the oil? What is it that we need to be prepared with and must not run out of? And secondly, how should we wait? And you'll have to wait for me to get to that bit. And when I do, as it's Remembrance Sunday, I'll also talk a little bit about war and peace. So firstly, the oil. The problem that the five foolish bridesmaids had was not that they fell asleep. All the women fell asleep. The problem was that while they slept, the lamps used up the oil that was in them and without any spare, they ran out of oil for the lamps. This was an oil crisis, a fuel crisis, or perhaps in today, today's society, we would say a petrol crisis. It's fairly simple. When the arrow on the petrol tank points to empty, you're going to run out of petrol. I remember driving my son Nigel on a school field trip, field, an outing. I had him and a couple of other six or seven year olds in my petrol guzzling car, a minivan. 
And we were going to go whale watching. We were traveling to Point Reyes Lighthouse on the Pacific coast of California. And I hadn't filled up with petrol beforehand, thinking that I had enough to get me there and I could stop on the way back. As we got close to Point Reyes, I realized that I was getting low on petrol. But we had to be there at a certain time and I didn't want to be late. Just after I passed the last place of any size, the fuel light came on. From prior experience with that car, I knew I had at least seven litres in the tank. The car said I could do 50 miles and I had 25 miles to go. No problem, I thought. Except it was a windy, slow road. And about halfway there, it said I had zero miles left in the tank. Now I was worried. But after an anxious ride, we did make it. But then I had to get back. And that petrol station was 25 miles back along the same windy road and there was not a closer one. On the return trip, I was convinced that we would run out of petrol. I did have the reassurance that one of the other parents was tailing me. In the end, I made it to the petrol station. How, I'm not sure because the tank took its full capacity in petrol. I'm convinced that I had a miracle and that we ran on empty. But it's not an experience that I would recommend. And I certainly felt foolish. For years afterwards, my son would beg me to fill up if he noticed the fuel gauge getting low. If it got as far as that beep and the fuel light coming on, he would be really panicking. In our parable, we were not told why the five bridesmaids didn't help the wise ones, didn't help the five foolish ones. Perhaps they only had enough for themselves. Perhaps they knew the foolish ones had barrel loads at home. Or perhaps they were hoarding it and the ones called foolish were really poor and didn't have any money. The parable doesn't say a word about motives or extenuating circumstances. In a sermon she preached, Reverend Dr. Anna Carter Florence from Columbia Theological Seminary in Georgia suggests this. The parable's only concern is what they brought with them when they left the house. Maybe this is not a story about how much oil you have. Maybe it's a story about how much oil you can carry with you. When your lamp goes out, you may have gallons of oil sitting at home, but it's not going to do you any good there. What does the oil you carry with you look like? What is the oil? Perhaps it's not a commodity that we buy and sell. If a two-year-old doesn't get a nap, they're going to crash. If you've worked 80-hour weeks for longer than you care to know, your relationships are going to suffer. It's not really something any of us can avoid. There are some kinds of fuel that are just not negotiable. If you eat junk food for 20 years, your body's going to let you know about it. There are also some kinds of oil that you can't borrow from anyone else. Teenagers learn this at a certain point. You can borrow someone's homework and get by on the assignment, but you can't borrow the hours they put in studying for the test. There are some kinds of preparation that we can only do for ourselves. There are some reserves that no one can build up for us. You can't borrow somebody else's peace of mind or their passion for God. You have to find it yourself. So what about if we think about the oil in terms of our spiritual lives, our task to be a lamp or a light for others? We can only be a lit lamp for as long as there's still oil in the lamp. When the oil runs out, the lamp goes out and you've got nothing to give. A Christian with no oil can't be the light for the world no matter how much they want to be. When you run spiritually dry, then you cannot be a lamp. 
Remember that safety speech that we hear on aeroplanes? In the event of an emergency, oxygen masks will drop from the ceiling. Please be sure to secure your own oxygen mask first before assisting others. There's another inspirational quote or question that has been doing the rounds on social media for a few years now. It goes like this. You're holding a cup of coffee when somebody comes along and bumps into you or shakes your arm, making you spill your coffee everywhere. Why did you spill the coffee? Because somebody bumped into you. Wrong answer. You spilled the coffee because there was coffee in the cup. Had there been tea in the cup, you'd have spilt tea. Whatever's inside the cup will spill out. Therefore, when life comes along and shakes you, which will happen, whatever's inside of you will come out. It's easy to fake it until you get rattled. So we have to ask ourselves, what's in my cup? When life gets tough, what spills over? Joy, gratefulness, peace and humility? Or anger, bitterness, harsh words and reactions? Life provides the cup, you choose how to fill it. So let's work towards filling our cups with gratitude, forgiveness, joy, words of affirmation and kindness, gentleness and love for others. Perhaps you've seen that on your social media feeds too. What fills your cup up spiritually? What are you filling it with? What fills your lamp up spiritually? What replenishes your oil? If we put it off, then time will eventually run out and we will get caught out. The time comes when we all have to draw on the oil that we already have. And that oil is going to come from what fuels us spiritually right now. Our personal spiritual disciplines fill us up. We can't minister to others if there's nothing there. We cannot survive the dark times ourselves if we're already running on empty. John Wesley called these acts of piety. Daily scripture reading, daily prayer or meditation, participating in study together, weekly worship, monthly communion, periodic fasting. And perhaps there are other ways that fill you too. A walk by the river, walking a labyrinth, journaling, painting, colouring your prayers, cooking, gardening, reading. But Wesley also taught us that acts of mercy were important spiritual disciplines too. Being in mission to others through acts of compassion or charity and also acts of justice and advocacy. In a pandemic, we might have to get creative and it might look different to before, but it's still possible. And these things will fuel us spiritually. I know that many of you have found during this pandemic that is your faith and those spiritual disciplines that you have done over the years that have given you the strength to get through lockdown the first time and then through these last few difficult months. And it's those actions that are going to sustain you in the lockdown that began again on Thursday. And if you're not doing these things, then now's a good time to start. And if you are, well, maybe things are getting stale and you need to shake it up a bit. Take time daily to fill your soul so that you have some spiritual resources to cope with the season, something to draw on, so that when Christ arrives, you'll be there to see it and to recognise his presence. One of the best ways that I've found to replenish my soul is to study with others and to read widely. If you've been in a study group talking about questions like why there's so much suffering in the world and what that tells us about the nature of God, then when something bad happens, there are resources to draw on to make sense of the circumstances. It doesn't stop bad things happening, but it provides an understanding and the ability to see those who come and help you as being Christ to you. 
we learn together to see where Christ is in the world. In the dark times, we'll need the assurance of the abundant promises of God and a peace that passes understanding. That assurance and peace comes from the promises that we will have, immer have immersed ourselves in as we carried out those acts of piety and filled ourselves up with oil. Others might be relying on us too. Like my son who got concerned that if I let the fuel tank get too low, he didn't like the thought of running out of fuel. He knew we couldn't run on empty. We each have many people who rely on us to stay spiritually fueled and strong for them. We all have traveling companions who will be anxious for us to keep ourselves fueled up. Dark times do come and we'll need that oil that we cannot borrow. And we'll have to draw on the oil that we do already have. Those inner resources and spiritual reserves. So let's concentrate on filling our lamps and filling them out of joy. Because then we'll be ready to see Jesus and even go to the party with him. Second, and more briefly, an observation about waiting. You know the old saying, Lord, grant me patience and I want it now. We don't do waiting very well. The parable ended with Jesus saying, keep awake for you know neither the time, sorry, keep awake for you know neither the day nor the hour. Jesus seems to understand that there's some waiting that we will be called to do. It might be a longer night and wait than we're expecting, but morning will come. Waiting is an act of faith. It's part of our faith journey and we need to learn to wait well. We wait for all sorts of things. We wait for good news or bad from doctor's diagnoses or business reports. We wait for better time for struggling relatives and friends and strangers. We wait for births and deaths. We wait for justice for all. We wait for peace for the world. The parable reveals a tension between living in the present and planning for the future. The mistake of the foolish bridesmaids was not that they failed to believe that the bridegroom is returning and wasn't that they fell asleep, but that they failed to invest in what will keep their lamps burning and prepare them to see God's kingdom when it comes. They failed to wait well. Part of waiting and is sleeping and resting as it takes a long time. And part is filling us with fuel to sustain us. And part of that fuel comes from the actions we take with acts of piety and acts of mercy. And sometimes that fuel that we have to fill ourselves with is courage. I was reminded this week of this quote by Winston Churchill. Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, the peacemakers, the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, this scripture passage is in today's lectionary, which is the set of readings that we use each Sunday. And the lectionary has been continually following the Gospel of Matthew since Trinity Sunday, reading from chapter 9 right through to chapter 25. So our reading is not specifically for Remembrance Day. And yet you can apply to all, all that I have just said to our current circumstances as we wait for peace in the world. Well, today we remember and give thanks for those in the past who gave their lives as the ultimate sacrifice. We should also remember that the world is still at war 
Our sons and daughters are still going off to fight. My eldest sons are 30 years now and the youngest is 26. There are men and women that were at school with them who have or are currently serving in the United States armed forces. Some have been to Afghanistan and Iraq and a couple have died serving their country. World peace is still a long way off. As I film this, the United States election is about to happen and the United States looks as if it will enter a period of civil unrest. Fascism is on the rise in both America and in Europe. What oil do we need in our lamps as we wait for the coming of God's kingdom? How should we wait? As we wait for peace, our cups, our lamps need to be full of the right things. And then the waiting we do requires action too. Let's pledge ourselves to work for peace and reconciliation in our homes, our neighbourhood, our country and our world. May we be peacemakers and peacekeepers. What is required while we wait is an awakening of all the senses to what God is doing and promises to do in the world. Hearts that burn with prayers, eyes that study God's word, ears that hear the crying of God's children, hands that reach out to those in need, feet that find those who've been lost, and a taste to know God's goodness. So let us fuel up and then wait patiently and actively together. Because Christ came, Christ is here now, and Christ will come again. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer as a result of conflict and ask that God may give us peace. For the servicemen and women who have died in the violence of war, each one remembered by and known to God. May God give peace. For those who love them in death as in life, offering the distress of our grief and the sadness of our loss. May God give peace. For all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day, remembering family, friends and all who pray for their safe return. May God give peace. For civilian women, children and men whose lives are disfigured by war or terror, calling to mind in penitence the anger and hatreds of humanity. May God give peace. For peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and free, may God give peace. For all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military and religious, asking for gifts of wisdom and resolve in the search for reconciliation and peace. May God give peace. O God of truth and justice, we hold before you those whose memory we cherish and those whose names we will never know. Help us to lift our eyes above the torment of this broken world and grant us the grace to pray for those who wish us harm. As we honour the past, May we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life and hope. 
We pray now for other concerns that are on our hearts. This week, we especially lift up our country as we've headed into lockdown again. Be with all who are unable to get out, whose mental health is suffering. Be with those who are sick with COVID and with other conditions. Be with those who are grieving. Be with our essential workers as they put in many hours to keep us safe. We pray for the United States after the election this week that there will be peace in the land and in the world. We pray in the name of our Maker, our Saviour and Friend, saying together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you to everyone who participated in our worship service today, to Emma for reading, to Adrian Pell and Neil Heffelwaite and Elizabeth Story for their part in our music. Thank you. Next week, our preaching will be local preacher David Wellborn as we listen to Jesus' parable of the talents and ponder what risky discipleship looks like. We come now to the time in our service when we offer ourselves to God, our time, our talent and our treasure. I encourage you at this point to give to your local church and the work that that church is doing in Christ's name. Let us pray over your offering. Gracious God receives our gifts, tokens of thanks for your extravagant blessings, signs of trust in your coming reign of justice, peace and love. In Jesus' name, Amen. As our service draws to an end, let's join together as we fill our lamps with God's word and peace and our minds and hearts with the love of Jesus. It's number 504. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in us from day to day.
Go from here with your lamps filled with oil to wait with peace in your hearts. And may God, the creator, redeemer and sustainer, be with you all now and evermore. And all God's people say, Amen. <laughs>